Welcome to the sixth and final race and bias conversation of this academic year. We launched this series in the fall to help the graduate school community gain a better understanding of the many aspects of systemic racism and bias, and to highlight some of the outstanding research and activities that members of our community are engaged in on these issues. I want to thank everyone who has participated in these discussions. They have been insightful, thought-provoking, thought and they give me hope that together we can find ways to address some of these issues at Duke and beyond. Today, we are closing our series for the year with a discussion about racial, economic inequality in the United States. Our guest is William Sandy Darity Jr., the Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African American Studies and Economics. Professor Darity is the director of the du Bois, Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. He's also served as chair of Duke's Department of African and African American Studies and was the founding director of the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Inequality at Duke. Professor Darity's research focuses on inequality by race, class, and ethnicity, stratification economics, schooling and the racial achievement gap, North-South theories of trade and development, skin shade and labor market outcomes, the economics of reparations, the Atlantic slave trade and the industrial revolution, the history of economics and the social psychological effects of exposure to unemployment. He's published or edited 13 books and published more than 300 articles in professional outlets. His most recent book, co-authored with A. Kirsten Mullen in 2020, is From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. Dr. Darity has also been and continues to be a mentor to many, many young scholars of all stripes, especially scholars of color. He has also run several pipeline programs to get underrepresented students to go into economics PhD programs and increase the number of underrepresented individuals with PhDs in econ. His reach is broad and his effect is great. And I am pleased to give you Dr. Sandy Darity. Uh, thank you so much, Dean McLean. Uh, also, I'd like to say that uh, I've previously been extremely grateful to be honored by the Graduate School for receiving in 2020 one of the uh, mentoring awards. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Kendrick for his uh, communication, support, and encouragement for me to participate in this event. So um, I'd like to talk about the magnitude and scope of racial wealth inequality in the United States. There's a number of ways in which we can assess the degree of disparity between blacks and whites in particular in the United States. Uh, there are a number of indicators that we could resort to to try to, uh, to gauge the magnitude of these disparities. Uh, one of the more obvious is the fact that the black unemployment rate is consistently two times as high as the white unemployment rate. It's been the case since we first started collecting statistics by race on unemployment in the 1950s. Uh, we also know that uh, Black income levels, particularly with respect to families, uh, lag behind white income levels to the degree that typically a Black household has about 65% of the income that, uh, that a white household has uh, at the median. Um, other indicators that we could look at are disparities in a variety of areas in which people uh, are engaged. It could be political disparities. It could be differential treatment at the hands of the system of criminal justice. Uh, but the focus this, this, this afternoon that I'd like to pursue is to look specifically at, at wealth inequality in the United States and how that plays out by race. Uh, so let me begin by pointing out that it's important to distinguish between wealth and income. Uh, this may seem obvious to some of the folks in the audience, but I think it's something that has to be emphasized time and again, because particularly in the world of journalism, there is a tendency to confuse the two concepts. Um, 
and it's confused to such an extent that people frequently will make reference to rich families when they mean high income families, but not necessarily high wealth families. And the distinction is the following. Wealth is, the, is defined as the difference between what you own and what you owe, or the net value of your personal property. And this is distinct from income because wealth is a stock concept. It's a stock of resources that people can carry with them across time that can provide them with a wide range of opportunities, including the capacity to adjust in situations where there's a fall in income. Uh, and the fall in income might be due to uh, a medical emergency, catastrophic illness that takes place in a family, or it might be due to this, the sheer loss of a job. So, um, so wealth actually has a distinctive role, and it is a role that is associated with being a cushion or some type of an insurance mechanism for, for households and families. So income, in contrast with wealth, is a flow concept. It's a flow of resources that come to an individual or to a household in a given amount of time. And it's uh, primarily associated with what people earn. Uh, so your, your earnings is not your wealth. And, uh, and this distinction is actually critical. Uh, so let me share a passage from our recent book, uh, From Here to Equality, where we talk about the significance of thinking about wealth in particular and how it plays out with respect to racial differences in the United States. So we say the following, wealth is the best single indicator of the cumulative impact of white racism over time. Wealth the difference between what we own and what we owe, or the difference between the value of our assets and our debts, or the net value of our property, is the economic measure that best captures individual, family, and household well being. Wealth serves as a primary indicator of economic security. Wealthier families are better positioned to finance elite independent school and college education, access capital to start a business finance expensive medical procedures, reside in higher amenity neighborhoods, exert political influence through campaign financing, purchase better counsel if confronted with an expensive legal system, leave a bequest and or withstand financial hardship resulting from any number of emergencies. Wealth provides financial agency over one's life. Simply put, wealth gives individuals and families choice it provides economic security to take risks and it shields against financial loss. Now, it's also critical to recognize in thinking about racial differences in wealth that what we're really talking about are racial differences in opportunity and economic security. Uh, and these differences are staggering. Uh, in 2019, the Federal Reserve took its uh, triennial survey of consumer finances and uh, finally reported those results at the end of the year 2020. And those results with respect to how we assess or gauge the magnitude of black white differences in, in wealth or net worth are, are compelling. And, and I'd like to report on some of those, those results and, and related statistics. So the first thing I'd like to report on is the average difference in wealth between black and white households in the United States. And that average difference amounts to a, a, an absolute gap of $840,000 in net worth. Uh, that's almost, uh, well, it's approaching $1 million in difference in, in net worth. And it's a consequence of, uh, it's a consequence of the fact that all along the income distribution, there are sharp wealth differences between blacks and whites in the United States. Uh, one way to think about this is the fact that uh, white households taken collectively possess about 92% of the nation's wealth, although they constitute somewhere in the vicinity of 70% of the nation's population. Contrast, black households constitute approximately 13% of the nation's uh, population, but possess only two and a half percent of the nation's wealth. Uh, another compelling statistic that emerges from looking at the uh, Fed data is the fact that 
uh, white households, uh, they're, they're 25%, one quarter of white households in the United States have a net worth in excess of $1 million, while it's only 4% of black households. And then correspondingly, there are sharp differences in wealth at the lower end of the distribution. Uh, particularly if we look at the relationship between income and wealth, we find that the poorest whites in the United States in terms of income, the bottom 20% of the income distribution, uh, are families that possess a net worth at the median of about $15,000. Uh, it, uh, it is actually zero uh, for black households that are in the same income category. And if we were to take white households who are in the, uh, the bottom 40% of the wealth of the wealth distribution, they actually have a higher level of median wealth than all black households taken together. And so one could argue that the poorest white Americans actually have a level of wealth that is comparable to the level of wealth that's held by all black Americans, regardless of their income level. Uh, so these wealth differences are, are enormous. Uh, they result in an estimate that we generate in the pages of From Here to Equality of, uh, uh, of a, a magnitude of the sum that would be required to eliminate the racial wealth gap in the United States, a sum in the vicinity of 10 to $12 trillion. Uh, and we argue in From Here to Equality uh, that this is a sum that uh, would require federal expenditure uh, and it should be the foundation for a program of reparations, specifically for black Americans who are descendants of persons who were enslaved in the United States. Now, one of the other themes that we highlight in the book is the fact that resistance to reparations uh, frequently is a consequence of people having strong misperceptions about the sources of wealth inequality by race in the United States. In fact, uh, people have strong misperceptions about, uh, about economic inequality between blacks and whites on a wide range of dimensions. And so uh, I'd like to actually share a description of what people believe and what they believe falsely about racial economic inequality that we actually discuss in, 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 in our book. So let me share this particular passage with you. A Pew Research Center survey conducted in 2016 reveals the prevalence of mistaken beliefs. Researchers found that large proportions of both whites and blacks affirm there is no lingering racial financial disparity. Now, I just told you about how immense the racial financial disparity is in the United States, particularly with respect to wealth but large numbers of Americans don't believe that there is any such discrepancy. An astonishing 38% of blacks contended that blacks are at least as well off or better off financially than whites. Among whites, the proportion sharing that opinion was 42%. In addition, 38% of white respondents believe the nation has already made all the policy changes needed to give blacks equal rights with whites. A majority of white respondents thought blacks are treated as fairly as whites in the courts. More than 70% of whites thought that blacks are treated similarly to whites when applying for a loan or a mortgage, in the workplace, in restaurants, and when voting in elections. Less than 40% of Blacks shared the same views on their treatment in the courts, in seeking a loan or mortgage, or in the workplace. But a majority of Blacks shared the same views as most whites on their treatment in restaurants, 53%, and in the voting process, 57%. Now, half of whites uh, believe that Blacks are treated as fairly as, as whites in their encounters with the police, but in contrast, only uh, a mere 16% of Blacks shared this, this perspective. Uh, more than 60% of Whites did not believe racial discrimination continues to be an important barrier to Blacks getting ahead. 
47% of whites rejected the notion that lower quality schools constituted an obstacle for blacks. And 55% of whites rejected the idea that a lack of jobs prevents blacks from getting ahead. In all three of these cases, at least 66% of black respondents surveyed thought that these factors do in fact significantly inhibit black achievement. However, and this is the key however, however, with respect to factors associated with self-defeating deficiencies in the black community as important reasons for blacks not getting ahead, white and black respondents held similar views. A striking 43% of blacks said, a lack of motivation to work hard is an important factor producing black-white inequality, in contrast with only 30% of whites. Even higher proportions of both groups attributed any ongoing black-white gaps to family instability, 57% of blacks and 55% of whites, and to the lack of good role models, 51% of blacks and 50% of whites. So while there were sharp differences in black and white perceptions of the role of societal factors in perpetuating racial economic inequality, there was a sharp convergence on the role of alleged cultural behavioral factors. A significant proportion of blacks bought the view alleging that black dysfunction helps explain racial inequality in the United States. Moreover, to the extent that the respondents to the Pew survey saw racism as having any ongoing impact, more of them, both whites and blacks, emphasized individual prejudice as the problem rather than the system of laws and institutions. Now, of course, these findings from the Pew survey predate the year 2020, which appears to have had a galvanizing effect for uh, for an understanding of racial and economic inequality in the United States that really does focus on structural racism rather than interpersonal relationships. Uh, but we have to wonder how deep-seated that change in attitude is. Is it merely a function of the uh, outrage that people felt in observing uh, the very visible murder of, of George Floyd? Or is it uh, a true change in underlying sentiment about how American society operates and what its consequences are for its black and white citizens. Uh, what, what I would like to conclude my opening remarks with are some observations about what the actual factors are that are in play that produce uh, uh, the racial wealth gap in the United States. And I'd like to demonstrate that those factors are not really associated with forms of dysfunctional behavior on the part of black Americans. So let me turn to some of the myths that people uh, possess about why we have racial wealth differences. And I think one of the most prominent of these is the, uh, is the idea that uh, the racial wealth difference in the United States is attributable to differences uh, in, in financial literacy or financial know-how between blacks and whites. Now, uh, the, one of the difficulties with this argument is uh, that the, any measured difference between uh, blacks and whites in terms of financial knowledge uh, is, is not sufficient to even approximate explaining uh, a, a differential in absolute, uh, absolute in an, a differential in the absolute amount of wealth between black and white households that amounts to uh, $840,000. But in addition, uh, it is not clear that there are any significant difference in financial know-how between blacks and whites once you take into account the combination of household income and wealth levels. Uh, in a society in which wealth begets wealth, we do not have a situation in which the amount of financial know-how that individuals or households possess is independent of their level of resources. In fact, we could flip the causal chain around and instead of thinking that financial literacy produces greater levels of wealth in and of itself, we could assume that the higher level of wealth that a household or an individual possesses, the more likely they are to have greater knowledge about financial processes and financial systems. Uh, and let me emphasize that 
uh, financial knowledge or financial know-how is no protection against fraud. Uh, consider the case of Bernie Madoff and the clients who he defrauded. Uh, these are not people who we would we would assume had low financial literacy, uh, but they still could be subjected to the wiles of a con man. Uh, and the final point I'd like to make in this context is that financial literacy without any finances is actually really quite useless. Uh, it's it's like having uh, having a menu, but uh, not having any uh, any offerings that are actually brought out of the kitchen. Uh, it's like having a recipe and, uh, and and not having any any ingredients to to put into the recipe. And so uh, I would argue that if anything, uh, it may be the case that black financial decisions, given the level of resources that blacks have, might be displaying a great deal of wisdom. And, and there is some indication, for example, in studies of uh, individuals who have relatively low incomes, that they actually are better managers of their resources than individuals who are wealthier, simply because they do not have the capacity to protect themselves in the same way. Um, a second argument that's frequently made is that uh, the financial the financial gap in in net worth is is due to uh, educational differences between blacks and whites. Uh, but here we have a stunning statistic that I think stands in sharp refutation of that view. Uh, black heads of household with a college degree have two thirds of the net worth of white heads of household who never finished high school. Uh, another frequently made claim that's related to the list in the Pew survey is the argument that, well, it's, it's because there's so many single parent black families that black wealth is so low. So the implication here is of course, uh, that there must not be any significant difference between uh, the levels of wealth that are held by uh, two parent black and white families. Uh, but that is not the case either. And in fact, uh, white families with a single parent as head actually have more than two times the wealth of black families that have two parents. Uh, a fourth idea that comes into play is the claim that blacks are simply much more profligate than whites. Uh, too attracted to the bling factor, uh, blacks tend to spend more and save less than whites do. Again, the data doesn't support this. If anything, uh, once you take into account household income, it appears that blacks actually do save a comparable amount as whites, uh, if not more. In fact, one of the most recent studies that was produced by uh, a team of scholars at Brandeis University indicates that actually white households spend 1.3 times as much in consumption uh, as black households for households that have similar levels of income. Uh, it's, it's obviously harder to control for similar levels of wealth because the wealth disparities are so much larger. But if you take two households that have comparable levels of income, you'll find that the white house households actually tend to spend more, 1.3 times as much. Now, what's the reason for this? Well, the reason is precisely because these households have much more wealth, which enables them to, to spend more out of a given level of income. And so the wealth differences do not arise as a consequence of black dysfunction or uh, poor judgment or poor financial decisions on the part of, of blacks that are, that are any worse than the financial decisions that are made by non-black Americans. Okay? So what is the source of the wealth gap in the United States? And, uh, I would like to argue that it's a consequence of national policy, that the way in which national policy has been conducted in the United States uh, has, been, has, been, uh, has been executed in such a way that we have constructed opportunities for white Americans to build wealth while black Americans have been compelled to decumulate wealth. Um, and uh, these policies originate uh, in strong measure in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, Black Americans who were newly emancipated were promised 40-acre land grants in restitution for their years of bondage. 
that promise was not fulfilled. And it was not fulfilled because President Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, had deep, deep ties and sentiments with the Confederacy. Even though he had been a unionist, uh, he did not maintain the same degree of antipathy towards the Confederacy that he maintained towards the newly emancipated, formerly enslaved. Uh, and so as a consequence, he reversed the policy of land allocation that had begun uh, with General Sherman's Special Field Orders Number 15. And he began a process of abrogation, abrogating any commitments that were made to the provision of land to, to the freedmen, freed women, uh, in the as, as soon as the Civil War ended. At the same time, under the auspices of the Homestead Act of uh, 1862, the federal government was making 160 acre land allotments to white families, one and a half million white families in the Western territories of the United States that recently had been occupied and taken away from the native population uh, as, a, as, as a process that was going to complete the colonial settler agenda that the United States government was pursuing. Uh, those 1.5 million white families receiving land grants, and you know, if I was really going to be pejorative about this and the way in which people are pejorative about any kinds of resources that are received by black Americans from the federal government, we could call these, uh, these allotments of land uh, handouts from the federal government. Okay? Well, these 1.5 million families that receive these allotments have descendants today who are beneficiaries of the uh, of this of this uh, allocation of, of of wealth, a distribution of wealth that took place, uh, and I think it's estimated uh, that there are about 45 million living white Americans who are from families that have reaped the benefits of the of the Homestead Act. So that's the first policy. <laughs> the second policy is one of uh, of, of turning a blind eye. And uh, the blind eye was turned to the wave of massacres that took place, white massacres that took place in the United States from the end of the Civil War into the 1940s. Uh, they took place both in the North and South and in the Eastern and Western parts of the United States. They typically resulted in a substantial loss of black lives, but also very important in the context of thinking about wealth differences they resulted in the destruction of black owned property or the seizure and appropriation of that property by the white terrorists. Uh, in the year 1919 alone, there were about 35 of these events that took place in locations ranging from Elaine, Arkansas to Chicago, Illinois, to Washington, DC, to Baltimore, Maryland, to Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, and in all of these instances, there was significant loss of black lives and there was also uh, uh, property loss that was substantial. Uh, the most famous of these massacres uh, probably are the massacres that took place in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, in which a, uh, a duly elected uh, representative government that included both blacks and whites was essentially overthrown. It was a municipal coup d'etat. There had been previous municipal coup d'etats, particularly in Louisiana in 1873 and 1874 in the towns of Colfax and Cushada. So Wilmington was not a first, although some people have made the claim that, that that's the case. Uh, but Wilmington was perhaps the most dramatic because it brought an end to fusion politics in the United States and in the state of North Carolina in particular, and it restored uh, democratic rule of the Southern states during a period in which the Democratic Party was the white supremacist party. Uh, today, the Republican Party is the white supremacist party, but, uh, but uh, the, the Wilmington massacre was, was especially significant in that respect. Uh, the other massacre that's extremely well known or is increasingly well known is the Tulsa massacre of 1921 and uh, popular culture seems to have played a role in giving that particular massacre a high degree of visibility, uh, particularly the television show, The Watchmen. Uh, and it's a massacre 
that uh, was 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 especially devastating for uh, for black prosperity uh, because Tulsa's business district was known as a black Wall Street and it was a thriving and highly successful business district and it was completely razed to the ground. Uh, so the federal government looked the other way at all of these massacres and in some cases actually had some measure of complicity with the massacres. Uh, there are some arguments that can be made that the federal government did have a hand in the Wilmington massacre of 1898. And it's clear that the federal government approved of the massacre that took place in Ocoee, Florida in 1919, uh, quite explicitly. Uh, so then uh, in the 20th century, we have a transition that takes place away from land allocation as the source of wealth building toward home ownership as the mechanism for wealth building. And again, it's differentially applied by race in such a way that white wealth accumulates, black wealth decumulates. Um, if we look specifically at the legislation that was generated during the course of the New Deal, uh, and especially the, the Federal Housing Administration, uh, we find that the practices and resources that were devoted to home buying supports for American citizens were applied in a highly discriminatory fashion in a manner that excluded black home buyers from full participation. Um, another piece of legislation that was really critical in the mix concerning uh, home ownership or home buying support from the federal government was the GI Bill. Uh, that was implemented in the aftermath of World War II. And here is a situation in which one of the important provisions of the GI Bill were resources for, uh, for purchasing a home. And these were discriminatorily applied in such a way that uh, in the most extreme example, in the state of Mississippi, out of 3,000 returning veterans from World War II, both black and white, only two black veterans were able to take advantage of the home buying provisions of the GI Bill. Uh, and the discriminatory application of the GI Bill was a consequence of the way in which the legislation had been crafted, designed to placate uh, Southern segregationists. Uh, the bill gave local authority uh, complete discretion over uh, over the approval of the designation designation of resources under the home buying provisions, and as a consequence, uh, local authorities made the decision on a consistent basis to give those resources to white returning veterans and not black returning veterans. And then, if we compound the situation with the history of restrictive covenants and then uh, predatory lending coupled with redlining, uh, we have a situation in which we have a perfect storm uh, in which uh, home ownership becomes a strong source of wealth and the building of a white middle class uh, to, the, uh, to the detriment of black wealth building and to the disadvantage of the growth of a, of a black middle class. So it's public policy that lies at the heart of the racial wealth difference uh, and so it would require a public policy remedy to alter that set of circumstances. And so person Mullen and I argue in From Here to Equality that the historical record concerning anti-Black wealth accumulation must be supplanted by a new transformative set of policies that go about the process of eliminating the racial wealth gap and we say that this should be the core component of a reparations program for Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Uh, and we make the argument in, in the book, in the final chapter of the book, in, in its strongest form, uh, where we attempt to outline what an actual reparations program might look like. And uh, uh, we think that uh, an actual reparations program should have four essential features, and this is what I'll close with. First, uh, 
a reparations program should specify that Black Americans who were descendants of persons enslaved in the United States are the eligible recipients. Second, a reparations plan must specify that its priority will be elimination of the racial wealth difference in the United States in such a way that the Black asset position is raised to the level of the white asset position on average in the United States. Third, um, a reparations plan must indicate that eligible recipients will receive direct payments out of the plan so that they will have full discretion over the use of the resources. Uh, this is precisely what has happened in other instances of reparations in the United States. Uh, for example, uh, the provision of reparations to Japanese Americans who were unjustly incarcerated during the course of World War II, subjected to mass incarceration. They received direct payments and they had full discretion over the use of those payments. And similarly, uh, the German government's payments to victims of the Holocaust, uh, those direct payments uh, were entirely uh, to be used at the discretion of, of the recipients as well. And then the fourth and final characteristic of a reparations plan is this is something that must be conducted at the federal level. It must be something that's conducted with congressional approval and it must be something that's administered by the federal government. And, and this is because only the federal government has the capacity to finance a program that would require 10 to $12 trillion. Uh, if we were to take the budgets of all state and local governments, and here I would include cities that are engaged in the process of purportedly conducting reparations plans like Asheville, North Carolina, or Evanston, Illinois, or states, for example, like the state of California. Uh, if we were to take their budgets and sum them together, the total would come to $3.1 trillion. That's a $7 trillion shortfall at minimum from what would be required to eliminate the racial wealth gap. And moreover, if states and localities devoted all of their annual budget to a reparations fund, uh, they wouldn't have the capacity to perform any of their normal services at all. So it's the federal government that has the ability to finance it, but it's also the federal government that has the culpability because it's the federal government who engineered the policies and created the legal and authority climate that produced the racial wealth gap in the United States. What is your, what are your thoughts about Evanston, Illinois' decision either yesterday or the day before to provide reparations, I put in quotes, to blacks who lived in Evanston, I believe it was from like 1912 to 1960 something, who were denied the ability to purchase homes and other kinds of, and were subjected to other kinds of discriminatory practices. It, it seems revolutionary in the sense, and I'm not sure what went into their, their, their decision-making or why, you know, they, but it's, it's, amazing that they've kind of come to that. So what are your thoughts? So um, Evanston's Board of Aldermen, that's, that's what they call it there, uh, voted eight to one to approve of what they are labeling a reparations plan. Uh, there was one dissenter, uh, a black woman who is a, uh, who is a strong supporter of reparations. Uh, but her position was that this is really misguided and misleading to refer to this initiative as if it is reparations. Now, as, as I indicated uh, earlier, that you know, it's, 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 the term reparations should be reserved for a program that addresses the racial wealth gap in the United States. And there's no way that any single municipality or or all municipalities and state governments taken together can meet the requirements in terms of a reparations bill. Uh, and I, I talked about you know, the fact that their budgets collectively amount to $3.1 trillion. So they don't, they don't have the ability to meet 
at least a $10 trillion uh, obligation that would eliminate the racial wealth gap. Uh, so that's, 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 that's my first complaint that it's, it's actually, uh, uh, it's actually uh, a bit of bait and switch to refer to any type of local initiative or piecemeal initiative as if it constitutes reparations. Uh, the second thing is that of course, the kinds of discriminatory policies that were practiced in, in, in Evanston. And I, I think the interval of time was 1919 to 1969 that they chose. And there's some controversy over uh, you know, the arbitrariness of that particular interval of time. But the policies that they're describing are policies that were either sanctioned or mandated by the federal government. And they were policies that were practiced all across the country. So there's nothing particularly unique about Evanston on those grounds. Uh, and then the, the third thing that's, 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 that's problematic about the Evanston proposal, um, and I'd feel a lot better about it if they didn't call it reparations, uh, but if they, they would call it a housing voucher program because that's essentially what it is. It provides uh, any individual who is deemed eligible after application for the funds, uh, $25,000 that can be put towards one of two purposes. Either uh, it, the, the funds can be devoted towards uh, a down payment for uh, a, a purchase of a new home, or they can be devoted to home improvement activities. Uh, neither of these practices, given that amount, will do much at all to uh, eliminate racial wealth differences in Evanston or using the same kind of policy on a national basis, uh, on a nationwide basis. One of the key assumptions here is that the core dimension of wealth disparities or disparities in home ownership, and this is a mistake. Um, even though there are significant differences in home ownership, uh, there are other categories of, of assets that where there are sharp differences. Uh, retirement accounts, uh, stocks and bonds, uh, non-residential real estate, um, and, 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 and so forth. And so focusing exclusively on home ownership is not the, the key to eliminating the racial wealth gap. And in fact, what we argue is you should give individuals the sum of money that corresponds to the differential and let them choose to use it as they please. In Evanston, that type of discretion is taken away from the individuals who are going to receive the funds. Uh, and a final point I'll make is that they're financing this out of the use of revenues from a cannabis excise tax. And that cannabis excise tax in the present moment has generated $400,000 in, in, in revenues. If you were to uh, give $25,000 to each eligible recipient out of that fund, you can provide resources to 16 people. Wow, um, that, that, yeah, I'm so glad you broke that down. That was a great question, Paula. But, but Sandy, I was just recently reading David, uh, David Ansel's The Death Gap. You know, he was the physician who worked in Chicago at Rush Hospital, and he talked about in inequality is a disease and that how long you live depends on where you live. But this is all connected to what you're talking about. You talked about housing and education, the GI Bill, but health disparities mm -hmm. as well. Can you say a bit about that? And, 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 and I just like the way he defined it as inequality as a disease. Inequality kills us. Yeah, uh, in, in April last year, around the time that our, our, our book first, uh, first came out, uh, Kirsten Mullen and I uh, did a couple of opinion pieces on, on the implications of the pandemic for reparations. And uh, one of the things that we concluded is uh, while folks talk about pre-existing conditions in the context of uh, chronic ailments that individuals might have like diabetes, asthma, hypertension, other related coronary, uh, coronary diseases, um, that the, the, the fundamental pre-existing condition that uh, all these other problems tend to stem from uh, is, is the racial wealth gap, is that type of inequality that David Ansel's talking about. So uh, 
so yeah, I, I would I would say that the uh, the analogy he draws is extremely powerful, and it's something that I I would agree with. There is a, oh question. There is a question from our colleague Dr. Ann Mitchell Wisnett. Ann, if you would unmute yourself. Thank you. Absolutely. Hi there, Sandy. Good to see you. Um, and thank Hi, you. Hi Ann. How are you? Hey. All right, this was so interesting. Um, so my question has to do with, is sort of related to your observation that there were still 45 million families today that descended from those who, I think you said 45 million, who uh, benefited from the Homestead Act, white yep. families. And I'm wondering what research is being done or has been done about um, the continuing kind of cascade of wealth within uh, white families who were slaveholding families and how that has carried down the generations. Um, you know, I know that if you following the um, Sam's Reckoning folks over at UNC that are looking at these particular uh, families that UNC um, recognized on the Silent Sam Monument as to participating in the Confederacy, they are tracing the sort of great wealth that those families had um, and those individuals. And I'm just wondering if there's been a kind of larger tracing about how that wealth carried forward um, into today. So uh, UNC is particularly interesting on this score because of the timing of when the university originates. Um, and, and we're actually, we, we, we find that there are institutions like the University of Chicago that uh, came into existence after the Civil War ended and after slavery ended, but still, have a financial connection to uh, slaveholding families, but UNC has a strong connection to slaveholding families in part because it comes into operation in 1795 and all the land that the university possesses is land that was donated by slaveholding families uh, in the area of Chapel Hill. One of those slaveholding families is uh, the ancestral family uh, of William Rand Keenan Jr. Uh, so you could look at the Keenan family's history and it's directly connected to slaveholding. I'm not aware of any study that looks at multiple slaveholding families simultaneously and attempts to come up with some sort of aggregate estimate of contemporary wealth that's linked to uh, a pattern of slaveholding, but you can take individual families and there are very, very strong connections that can be drawn. Um, and even though the uh, Confederacy lost the war and at a certain stage, a significant number of the slaveholding families had lost their property, uh, by 1880 or so, uh, there was a, a process that was clearly underway of restoring uh, the property to those families. And so uh, they're suffering for the most part, and I use suffering in quotation marks, uh, their suffering for the most part was, was temporary. Uh, and so there is a straight line that can be drawn from slaveholding to contemporary wealth in many, many families. But I, I'm just not aware of any study that's tried to bring all of those cases together uh, and also account for cases where maybe wealth wasn't actually restored. Uh, but, uh, but I think in, in the majority of cases that we can think about, uh, former families, particularly families that had relatively large sl slave holdings in excess of you know, 20 to 25 people are families that are extremely wealthy today. Thank you. Our next question comes from our colleague, Rick Larrick. Rick, go ahead. Uh, Sandy, thank you for this talk. I, I um, appreciate what you had said at various points earlier about pointing to single factors like education as not being sufficient for explaining the current wealth gap. But I think that the thing I find powerful to think about is even after slavery, a century of the compounding effects of everything, redlining, educational disadvantage, health disadvantage, job disadvantages, as kind of in a classic business way, instead of things compounding upward, it is, I think, what you described as a kind of decumulative effect. And, and so I guess I, I'm just curious, is there, is there a resource for thinking about the actual math behind 
the compounding effects of disadvantages or, or how would you even, I think this is how you're describing things, but I'd be curious to hear, how would you describe this combination of factors? Because it seems like it isn't one in the current moment, it's a, an accumulation of 10 over a century. So from my perspective, it's an accumulation over, uh, over close to two centuries yeah. uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, you know, obviously you can make the argument that slavery itself was an initial source of wealth inequality. And in fact, uh, I've said on a, a couple of occasions that in, in reference to Ira Katz Nelson's book, When Affirmative Action Was White, uh, where Katz Nelson is talking about the way in which the GI Bill and the Federal Housing Administration's practices were applied, uh, I've, I've said, well, the original form of affirmative action for white Americans was, was the enslavement of, uh, of, of Africans who were forced to migrate to the United States. And so, uh, so I think, yes, there's, there's definitely a cumulative process that, that comes into play in explaining what we observe today. Um, you know, we've, we've been trying to argue uh, in, in From Here to Equality that the, those cumulative effects are, for the most part, captured in the racial wealth differential in the United States. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's an economic indicator that constitutes a kind of a summary statistic for all of these effects over time. Now, uh, you know, if, if you're thinking about manifestations of these effects that play out in other facets of, of life, like health disparities, for example, a strong argument can be made that uh, the adverse policies with respect to black wealth accumulation are a critical source of those health disparities in the present moment. And there's actually um, a couple of studies that are out now that are arguing that had we had a reparations plan in place that eliminated the racial wealth gap prior to the pandemic, uh, the effects of the pandemic would have hardly been as severe and hardly have been as, uh, as, as, as disparate between uh, blacks and whites in the United States. And even one of the studies suggests that the level of infection and, and mortality among whites would have been reduced if it was reduced among blacks. We are almost at time, but I would like to acknowledge our colleague, Elizabeth Green. Elizabeth, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Well, it's in the chat. Um... So Blacks have recently halved fertility in the United States. Was that to stop inheritance dissipation? Does wealth equal resilience, financial agency, de-risking, potential energy, keeping reproductive choices open, and the prevention of population saturation economy? Well, okay, so first of all, I, 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 I'm not sure what you mean by population saturation economy. I'm not a zero population growth advocate. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what that, that refers to. Uh, I think that uh, fertility decisions should be a matter of household preferences. Uh, and I don't think that that's an arena in which, uh, which government should, should, should be engaged in any direct or immediate way. Uh, we do know that as families have higher levels of resources, they tend to have fewer children. And so uh, you could make the argument if you're really concerned about family size in some sense, you could make the argument that if you improve the wealth condition of black Americans, then there might be some reduction in fertility. Uh, but in the present moment, all Americans have relatively low levels of fertility. It's just that the black rate of fertility is a little bit higher. Uh, the, the outliers to that claim are of course, uh, is, is the Latino community uh, which probably has the highest rate of fertility of all. But, uh, but this is not a country in which we have uh, extraordinary population growth that's due to natural increase. Uh, our population increase is, is, is disproportionately due to, to migration in the present moment. So, uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what, what the issue is here. I, I will say this. 
there's an important distinction that's made by Malcolm X that may be relevant to some of the points that are, are being made here. Um, and Malcolm X talks about a situation in which somebody has plunged a knife into his back nine inches. And he makes a distinction between the process of pulling the knife out and healing the wound. Um, and by pulling the knife out, he means uh, eliminating the various kinds of practices and policies that have caused the damage. But uh, the damage itself is not addressed by pulling the knife out. The damage requires healing the wound. And so from, uh, from, from our perspective, you need to do both. And healing the wound is what we view as reparations. But stopping the harm is something that also has to occur. In uh, From Here to Equality, we talk about closure as one of the characteristics of a reparations program. And closure is a stage at which the victimized community makes no further claims on, 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 uh, on the culpable party. Um, and uh, this means that the victimized community comes to the, uh, the point of saying, that the debt has been paid, that the account is settled. Uh, but for them to permanently say that the account is settled requires there to be no renewal of the atrocities or no inauguration of another set of atrocities. And so um, uh, closure requires the knife to be pulled out and to be kept out. And that is not reparations. That is something that is essential and it must happen, but that's not reparations. Reparations is compensation for the effects of the knife blow. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Darity, for your presentation and to all of you who have joined us for our race and bias conversations during the fall 2020 and spring 2021 semesters. Over the course of this year, our conversations have covered desegregation of Duke and other private higher education institutions in the South, the relationship between the police and the community, opportunities to keep building a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive university, structural inequality and racism through the lens of challenges and policies at Duke, the experiences of alumni who are leading diversity and inclusion initiatives at other institutions. And this evening, racial economic inequality in the United States. These conversations have been led by Duke faculty, Duke administrators, Duke alumni, and graduate students. And thank you to all for your participation. I also wanna thank my colleagues on the planning team and the graduate school for these events and for their efforts in pulling together some dynamic and terrific discussions. Now, don't forget that all the conversations have been recorded and they're available online at gradschool.duke.edu forward slash race bias, one word, gradschool.duke.edu forward slash race bias. Alan, Alan, may I, I'm sorry, may I interrupt? I'm sorry, your, your beautiful closing. Let me interrupt and say that you know, we can send everyone the link to, um, to the recordings um, because we, we have the information on everyone. We can do that, right, to make it easier. But the right. other thing I want to say, I, I just want to personally thank Sandy Derry, my colleague, my friend. This is so important. I also want to encourage you all to go on Amazon and order his books. I just ordered two more after this. <laughs> and there's a beautiful review in the New York Review of Books on the piece. It's a long, it's a really great piece. If, if you don't have time to read the book, you should definitely get the New York Review of Book and th that talks about uh, From Here to Equality. So that's my plug, Sandy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dean Looney. I'm sorry, Alan. <laughs> so just some final thoughts. Our Race and Bias Conversation series may be concluding for the academic year, but our work on these issues in the graduate school does not. We will be reviewing the discussions from this series of conversations to distill some takeaways, to get some key themes and actions. So please stay tuned.
Finally, to our students who will be graduating soon, congratulations. We wish you the best in your future endeavors. Please remain in touch with us in the graduate school, and we hope that you will get involved as alumni. Now to our continuing students, our colleagues, and alumni, you can always find out what we're up to at our website, as Dean Louis said, gradschool.duke.edu. Thank you for your support. Continue to stay safe and well, and good evening.